Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Bob Ost again. Uh, every Friday we do this. It's Friday, 5 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, I'm in New York. We have people from all over the country and all over the world in our room today, which is kind of exciting. Uh, one of the reasons why we're going to keep doing this virtual amazing opportunity that Zoom provides us, uh, even though we're opening up live in New York, um, I'm, I'm not going to give up my international uh, connections through Zoom. So uh, this is our true community gathering. And um, it started April 17th. Uh, this is, I think, the 82nd consecutive Friday that we're doing. Um, it started April 17th, 2020. Um, we all were kind of bewildered about what to do in, in something that was called lockdown that we were completely unfamiliar with. And what did it all mean? And was it real? I, I think for a lot of us, it was like, was, is this real? Is this really happening? Um, but uh, people started feeling isolated and helpless and frustrated. And I asked people whether they wanted to meet in a Zoom room. I had recently learned what a Zoom room was. It wasn't that it was something I knew really well. Uh, I learned how to do this and uh, opened up a room and we started talking on Fridays at five, four, it was 4.30 then, it's five o'clock now. Um, and our conversations were really a lot about how to create art during, during a pandemic. Um, so much had been different, so much had changed for all of us. And it was very confusing and very confounding. Um, but we found that by coming into a room and talking about what we're going through, um, it might have been a little healing, I'd like to think, uh, for some of us, for many of us. And we started finding out that everybody was finding ways uh, to, to be active and productive during, during the shutdown. Now the conversation is changing. Um, we're, we're finally making a dent, or more than a dent, in COVID. We're finally really on the way to defeating it. Um, so we're, our conversations were all about about making art during COVID, and now we're at a, pl a place where actually we're coming into the the world again. We're we're able to go live. Um, there are people that are making it harder. Um, I I don't want to be a dictator, or because uh, I know that makes people people crazy. But I do want to say that um, it would help the whole process for everybody if if everybody would get vac vaccinated. Um, I know that people make their own choices. Uh, they bewilder me sometimes. Uh, I just think that you you have to be vaccinated, not because you think you're going to get COVID, but because you could be an unknown spreader of COVID to other people. You might not be vulnerable to it, but think of the people around you that might be. So uh, that's my little bid for vaccination. I'm, I'm glad that I'm fully vaccinated and I have my booster shot. Yay. Um, so we're talking about coming back to, to life. We're talking about theater reopening. Uh, and what is that process like? It's, it's, not, it's not just pushing a start button. I mean, I ironically call this pushing the restart button or something like that. Um, knowing that, or assuming that when I talk to Martin and Neil, who you're gonna meet in a moment, um, we're gonna find that it wasn't quite as simple as all that. Uh, what has been involved in getting projects back especially and what's the difference between projects that were scheduled before and put on hold and then taken off hold and projects that are being started new now i think that there might be some differences in those and i'm going to introduce you now to my guests and we're going to start talking about all of this stuff um martin platt friend of, friend of mine for many years now and actually he used to teach the foundations class that we have the producers actually the producers development and mentorship program uh he, he's actually taught the class when it was a combined class wasn't it martin or, or were you foundations i think it was the. we didn't do the advanced class we just did the i guess it was foundations yeah it, it was called basic then we call it foundations right. now we're trying to find a way of making it sound like it's okay it's really worthwhile guys we don't we don't think any less of you because you're just starting out and learning about producing um and Neil Gooding, you want to tell us where you are right now and uh, give us a little bit about yourself too? Oh, uh, I'm back in New York. After, You're back in New York? Yeah, after the most crazy pathway from London via Croatia, Amsterdam, and Toronto. Um, so, so yeah, I'm back, I'm back in New York now. 
Okay, so uh, guys, you know what we're you know what we want to talk about. Um, hopefully, you guys have have things that you specifically want to say. If I don't ask the right questions, just just answer answer what you want us to know. Um, but Martin, let's let's start with you. Um, what what was it like stopping your projects? I know you had something running in New York when we went into, into shutdown. Tell yeah, we actually little... had uh, Woman in Black running at the McKittrick Hotel uh, in the club car there. And we've been running 10 weeks. Uh, we were in profit every week from the first performance. And March 12th, it all stopped. And we also had uh, The Last Ship starring Sting uh on tour they, they just finished la they were doing san francisco and that stopped too on march on march 13th so what did that mean for you as a producer i, I mean we've heard a little bit about this but i want to i'm going to go through a little bit of the pain before we can get to the the reopening part of this conversation well i mean you know it, it's hard because obviously your income disappears and you haven't recouped uh one of our shows had very good insurance. One of them didn't. Uh, uh, but the, the, oh, the hard it, thing it, was explain that. Uh, can you explain that? What, well, what the insurance? There were there were insurance policies uh, that some shows had for canceled performances that made up for lost income. So on one of our our shows, we were scheduled to run till the middle of April and then reopen in October. Uh, our insurance gave us the profits we would have earned from all those weeks. So our show recouped off the insurance. The other show we didn't produce, we just managed, and the producer didn't want to spend four thousand dollars for that insurance, so they got nothing. But Martin, I have heard that because of the number of shows that that needed to be covered by this insurance, not everybody was able to get full coverage, um, even though they had the policies. Is that not true? Did the, the insurance I mean, companies eventually come through? I mean, all of my Broadway colleagues got everything. Uh, and we got everything that, and we went in once and then we went back and got more from our policy. Wow. Uh, we ended up almost with the maximum that we were allowed to get. Uh, those policies don't exist anymore. I'm surprised. Oh yeah. They're not going to exist going forward, I guess. I, I, I'm surprised because I had heard last year when we were talking about this with other producers, that there was a lot of legal, legal entanglements that, that were, people were digging through to try to get reimbursed from the insurance I mean, I mean, the hard it, part, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't easy for some people no i mean the hard part for us was both these shows the last ship we had 35 people from the uk on the road and woman in black had two uk actors and we had to figure out really quickly how to get them flights and get them out of the country and back to the uk because we had no idea when borders would close or uh so that was a that was an adventure Good for you. Good for you for thinking quick on that. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot of us were just stunned. We're just walking around in a daze and not necessarily being proactive about what needed to happen in order to survive the, the, but the early I mean, days. The happy ending on those two shows is Woman, Woman in Black, we reopened. Uh, we're in our fourth week now back at the McKittrick. Uh, we've been sold out every week from the start. And uh, Last Ship is going to do a 16-week tour starting the end of next year back in the US. So they're both coming back. It's well, I, I suppose I'm, I'm going to have to walk over to the McKittrick. It's only a, like a block and a half from where I live. <laughs> so I, I will let you know when I'm coming. Okay. Um, Neil, t t what, what was it like for you? What tell us a little bit about your experience on uh, during shutdown? You, you were you were uh, where during when, when we actually started? So shutdown? I, um, I had opened the bridges of Madison County in Sydney on March the 11th flown out on March 12th thinking thinking life is back to New York and get things moving there and I got to LA and a, a producer friend of mine called me because I had six opening that night and he said don't rush because um we're not opening tonight and the whole of Broadway is shutting down so um a bit like Martin I mean I mean it really was it was sort of traumatic everywhere but there's varying degrees of trauma for me depending on whether or not it's a show that I am co-producing um in which case something, something like back to the future in london where which was um had only just opened in manchester um so there's a level of trauma there because the show closes and there's financial ramifications but the, the bigger trauma really is on the shows that you're the lead producer on because that's where the that's where the chaos is created where you know you're driving the ship and you have to make every email and every phone call about 
how to close those shows down and how to look after your cast and is there is there any insurance coverage and just all that so i so i the day i arrived back into the usa i had to cancel an entire tour in the us of a a Joni mitchell show that i had coming out of australia um it was a about a few days later that that um, Australia sort of closed down. It was a few days behind here, but that, that meant that Bridges, Madison County were shut down. So yeah, it was it was traumatic. Um, and you know, the on-flow effect has been that shows have now been delayed for 18 months, two years. And suddenly I think we all have too, too many projects on possibly and trying to figure out where they're going on and when they're going on. And, and I was just saying to Martin before, I mean, three or four of my projects are all ramping because the hard thing is to know which ones are going to kick off and when. And what I'm experiencing at the moment is I'm now getting some clarity on that, which is amazing, but they're also all kicking off in March, April next year. And so suddenly after, after 18 months of nothing on, as theatre tends to always do, all these projects are now going to overlap in a way that for me, I mean, one's in London, one's in New York, one's in Australia. So I go, well, that's, that's going to be, that's going to be a fascinating juggle of how my life works in that period of time. So. Can, can you list all the projects for us? Would you mind doing that? Because you're, you're doing a lot. You're doing a dozen, yeah, well, a dozen well, shows. Well, well, like I said, I mean, some of them are as co-producers. So I, I, as a co-producer, I'm on Back to the Future in London. I'm on What's New Pussycat that just is about to wrap up in Birmingham this week. And then we're hoping for a West End transfer for that. Back to the Future, we're now hoping we'll start rolling around the world like it's opened well. But, but again, there are shows that I... And, and I've got um, Harmony coming into the National Yiddish Theatre in April which I'm a co-producer on. But, but again, when you're a co-producer, once for me, once you've got through the phase of raising the money and those things, there's not any ongoing work. Whereas on a lot of my projects that I drive from scratch, all the work sits with my company as well. So, so for me, that covers things like um, in Australia, I have a, the, the, the Joni Mitchell show is going out on tour um, early next year. I have a new show called Leap being developed in Australia that we're hoping to take around the world. So that is on stage in April in Australia. Um, Drummer Queens, that was the only show that I was able to keep developing and premiere during the time of COVID has played its Australian season. And now we're in discussions to take that into Europe and into South Korea. Well, stop, stop for a second. What, 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 what was the story on Drama Queen? What, what do you mean that was, what, how was that different from the other ones? <laughs> Uh, well, well, I got lucky. So it's drummer queens, like as in female percussionists, um, even though my accent means that everybody thinks I'm saying drama queens. And um, the difference there was I got a grant from the Australian government when they were trying to stimulate producers to create work. And um, we got in a sort of, I, I don't know whether it's a good or bad double-edged sword. We got in a very lucky window where Australia was uh, doing very well with COVID um, at the end of 2020 and into early 2021, where pretty much the only theatres in the world that were open were in Australia. Um, that is not the case anymore, but it was, it was starting to study. But, but so Drummer Queens was able to premiere in January, February, March in Australia and tour around, um, which was great because it meant that the show could actually exist and, and you know, is all fully developed. But it was a tough time to have a, a theatre show on because people weren't really buying tickets in Australia at the time because, you know, there was a lot of um, worry about what, what would happen um so 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 at, le at least it exists though which is great okay so go on what, what are some are some of the other projects as well and i'm, I'm going to come back to you and, and also ask martin at some point some some specific questions about about restarting and re rebooting restarting whatever we we want to call this well, well i tend to always have a lot of projects on the go what, what i've specifically done during covid it was to so I've, I've got a, a, a two-person play called conversations with mother that uh we, we're hoping to lock a theater in for sort of um you know uh for, uh spring next year whatever whatever you call it here uh is it spring fall no, spring. spring and um and um and uh but what i have tried to do is to have a you, you, you've, you've, already, you've already established that you have like 75 things opening it in spring yeah yeah but but what i'm trying what i've tried to do is to have a range of and i always try to do this is have a range of projects some are very very big musicals some are smaller plays some are, are, are dance pieces and then also have them that uh are maybe moving in different streams so some of them are coming first into america some will start in australia and move out from there some will start in london um having just spent eight weeks in london a lot more of my development work I'm going to be taking to London at this point, having now 
<laughs> having now explored very thoroughly the costs of developing shows there and the costs of premiering shows there compared to New York. Um, so it has been a case of going, I've got a large slate of shows, like I said, which ones happen when at the moment is still the big question coming out of COVID. Like it's, the, it's still not lining up perfectly for all the shows to go, well, this one's pathway is there and it starts in April. It's starting for a handful of the projects and that's enough to keep me busy for now. But, but it's very hard to know exactly when these shows will start their, mo their momentum building again because it, it was all stopped for 18 months. And, and, the, the, and the hangover of that is that theatre companies have 18 months of shows banked back as well. They, they, they basically don't need to program a 2022 because they've got 2020 and 2021. A lot of the shows are still banked back into 2022. So, so it's still pretty fuzzy about how things will play out moving forward and when the, so the backlog will clear out and when new shows are ready to start hitting the stage. And of course, the biggest fuzziness in there is when do audiences want to see the shows? You know, when are they turning back? Uh, what what sort of shows do they want to see? Because a lot of the shows that I'm working on at the moment, um, some of them I've put aside going, I just don't think the zeitgeist is right for that show coming out of COVID, where people yeah, probably yeah, there's want a, to have... There's a, there's a couple of issues I want to, I want to actually talk to, to both of you about. I want to, also, I want to ask you whether... The, I'm going to ask you in a moment uh, after I have um, Martin talk about his projects a little bit more. I want to ask you whether do you think the business has, has changed at all from, from what we've been through? Um, are you doing things different way, in a different way now than you were before? Uh, Martin, so give us a little bit of a, the rundown of, of all the things here, because you're, you're incredibly busy as well. Yeah. In yeah, fact, well, you're, well, so, you're so busy, I can't believe you're here with us. Well, since I last saw you guys, uh, my, my longtime business partner, Dave Elliott, uh, remarried and moved to Boston. And I've gone into business with Tim Smith, who I did Last Ship and Woman in Black with. And we very quickly have offices in Chicago, New York, and London, and are doing a, a, too much stuff. Uh, so we have a second company of Woman in Black opening in San Francisco on December 15th at the Strand Theater, one of the ACT's theaters. Uh, we have a show we're managing called When Harry Met Rehab, with Dan Butler and Melissa Gilbert opening in Chicago in December. Uh, we have everybody's talking about Jamie, the West End musical at the Amundsen in January and February. Well, what's and the full, give us the full title of Jamie because everybody's talking about Jamie. Yeah. There's, a, there's a great film version of it on either Netflix or Amazon. Uh, and it may go to Broadway next season. We're not sure yet. Uh, we have a show opening in Pittsburgh in January called How the Hell Did I Get Here? A musical about, about and starring Leslie Nickel, who was Mrs. Patmore on Downton Abbey. This can open in Pittsburgh, then go to Chicago, and then come to the McKittrick Hotel in April when Woman in Black closes. Uh, in my spare time, I'm directing The Daughter-in-Law for The Mint that opens in February, a show I did 19 years ago. We've got a, a show with Wendell Pierce. We may be able to announce in December, opening off-Broadway in April. We have a new musical called Islander from Scotland, which will be opening, starting previews off Broadway in April. Uh, and then in which starting up tours next year of uh, uh, Matthew Bourne's new piece, The Midnight Bell, and a new dance piece called Message in a Bottle with a score by Sting. We're co-producing the 35th anniversary production of Serafina, which will open in South Africa in June uh, spend six months in South Africa, and then we're doing a, a, a U.S. slash world tour of that for the next two or three years. Uh, and we're developing a musical by Richie Bellens, which is going to start in Seattle in two years with the score by uh, Louis Perez and David DeLago from Los Lobos, a, a play about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sarah Day O'Connor that may go to Broadway next fall, and an Argentinian play. A ghost play that will open in Chicago and come to New York next fall. That's so part what you, of the So what are you doing to keep busy? Uh, I go to the opera. I, I go okay. to the theater a lot. I watch a lot of TV. So th those are, a lot, I mean, both of you are have, a, have an enormous number of, of, of projects that you're working on. And what, what also is very distinctive about this, and, and it sounds different than what I've heard in, in conversations like two or three years ago, uh, so you're both working um, in a lot of different places. You're not, you're not New York based at all. Um, Neil, you're, you're equal, you seem to be equally involved and in, engaged in uh, Australia, New York and London. Um, 
or the UK, I shouldn't say London, I should say, should say UK. Martin, you're, are you producing more outside of New York than you used to, or is that just, I wasn't well, aware with, of with it? With my new business partner, because uh, his business was primarily bringing shows uh, from the UK and Europe on tour. And I, I've been producing and general managing, so it's all coming together. So some of our shows are starting in markets that he uh, also has strong relationship with theaters. Like the Leslie Nickel musical is actually in the season at the Pittsburgh Public Theater. That's where it's starting. Uh, so yeah, we're using a lot of different resources. And, and I, I, think, say, I think we and did I one say, of the. Let's say we did one of the first shows to open uh, this summer, which was Richard Nelson's last Rhinebeck play, The Michaels Abroad, which we did. Uh, actually the theater at Hunter but with the same cast that did all the shows. So we were there when the equity rules about restarting seemed to change every 10 days. And we just reacted and moved on. Um, so that's and, what- and I, and I would say, Bob, just following off that, 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 I mean, my disappointment over this 18 months of COVID has been what I thought was going to happen or what I hoped needed to happen was that New York was going to have a bit of a rationalization of costs and that the cost of developing shows here and the cost of producing shows here needed to be seriously looked at and, and brought more in line with the cost of doing things in other territories. And, and the opposite has happened. I think some of those other territories have done that process mm -hmm. and New York has got more expensive. And so, I, I mean, I, I, you know, Martin and I were in London recently and I, and I kind of hit him up with a question saying, explain to me why I would ever produce or workshop something in New York again. And, and it's a hard one to answer when you're not from here. I think when, when you're only from New York and you only know how this works and you kind of just accept that this is what things cost, that's, that changes when you're not from New York and you've seen the cost base in Australia, you've seen the cost base in London, the quality of the work that's done and the quality of the creatives that are available to you. Um, it's, it's a tricky one because I, I really, the rationalization I thought needed to happen just didn't even get close to being started. I mean, so I mean, let's, I mean, break, let's break this down into specifics if we can. I mean- I, I could be specific about a project that we're doing. Yeah. Which is this little musical Islander, uh, which is a cast of two. Uh, there's no band because it involves looping, which they control on stage. It's a charming show. There's a film of it now. Uh, it was produced uh, when it left Edinburgh, it came to London and they produced it for about $45,000 in the same size theater we're going to be in, about 150 seats in the round for $45,000. We're, we're doing it as cheaply as it could possibly be done in New York, non-union, and it's $420,000. Yeah. And, so uh, and, on a, and on a similar level to that, um, I have put some money into a production of a show, I won't name a musical in London that's opening right now, in a 200-seat theater. That entire budget capitalization is 60,000 pounds and they get 14,000 pounds back from the government to, to once they've got it on. And yet my two person play in New York is looking like a 700,000 US capitalization. Yeah, that, 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 disc that discrepancy is, is inexplicable. Same, same size theaters. It, it's explicable, we just don't wanna know. Yeah. So, so basically Neil, you're, you're saying that you were, you were hoping that, that uh, we would have, that New York, the New York theater business would have understood the situation we're in and would have found ways to make things a little bit more affordable. Um, and obviously um, things have changed. I know all sorts of equity rules have changed wildly. They're, they're all over the place, but I, I, I'm, I've lost track of them, but none of them have made things cost less. It seems like everything has made them cost more. Um, the, 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 how has COVID affected budgets, uh, Martin, here? Well, I mean, you, you have to have a COVID officer, a, de a designated new employee. Uh, who's at every rehearsal and every performance, anytime you have union members in the building. Uh, we think during tech, you really have to have two because the days are too long. Uh, and that's an added cost. Uh, there's a bit of cleaning. You know, the rules have changed now, so it's more testing. Uh, when, we were, when we did the Michaels, we only had to, to test before we started. And if anybody tested positive, we had to test the whole company. Uh, and that never happened. Uh, but towards the end of the run, the rules changed and, and then it changed. So you have to test everybody twice a week. I know with, with Woman in Black, we're doing antigen tests, the ones you can do yourself, which are like $11 each. We're doing them three times a week for everybody that works for us there, which is about 14 people. Uh, 
But for, obviously for a Broadway show, it's an immense expense because you're doing the tests. Uh, you're having to do PCR tests, I think at least once a week, you know, the more expensive one. Uh, that's, that's been a big cost. And you're, I think a lot of shows are hiring more understudies than they normally would because you don't, you don't have to shut down shows if someone's sick, uh, but you may go deeper into understudies in order to keep your show open. And, and that's, I know a lot of shows have put a lot of money into that. Neil, how is that different in, in uh, UK and, and Australia? Uh, look, it's, it's fairly similar. I just think other, like if you look back to the future, what Martin was just saying there, we, we, we got to opening night and Roger Bart tested positive five hours before our opening night. So Roger was unable to perform opening night. I assume he was the lead. He, he's playing um, the, the Christopher the, Lloyd role, Dr. Right. Brown, yeah. yeah. So his understudy got put on with almost no rehearsal, smashed it to the wall. The next night he got sick. And, and, and because the show was so new, the understudy, team, you know, we, we, so the show basically had to shut down, not because it was mandated that if, that if you have COVID, you've got to shut the show, which is those rules that were very problematic in London um, about four months ago, five months ago, where shows where, where the rule was, if anybody tested positive, your show was just shut down for 10 days. That was a disastrous policy. Um, so that wasn't the problem with Back to the Future. The problem was for new shows, if you haven't had time to rehearse in your, you know, even if it's your automation team or, or your, your stage management team and, and the wrong people go down, that would shut your show. And like Martin said, the, the solution to that is more understudies um, and just a bit, and just the, 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 the cross your fingers and hope that people don't get sick at the wrong time as you're, as you're bedding the show down and training everybody up. Um, I, there's an interesting things that are just happening too, where I, I think, um, like on, on projects that I'm, you know, negotiating with actors for and stuff at the moment, uh, something has something has changed in the in the in the world in the eighteen months, and and people are just negotiating for a lot more money than they were getting pre COVID. Um, I guess there's a sense of entitlement that people have about well, I I wasn't able to work for eighteen months, or or even I think it's just more of like I now put a different value on myself than what I do. But I, but I'm watching actors talk themselves out of out of roles because of the finances and then have no job like it's not it's not like they've got a another show they're going to or another so it's and that's happening with stage management that's happening with so there's just some interesting uh, you're, you're talking about you're talking about uh, uk as and australia uh, that's, that's australia and in england i haven't i haven't done any, any one anything here in the u.s yet because i to be honest at the moment i'm keeping my powder dry in the usa and just letting the problems sort itself out because i was very much on the cusp of the wave of having a show very early in Australia and very early in London, I, I'd learnt, and I, and I and I was very much um, very positive on that of like get back into the market, get back in early. It, it took me to get slapped around in Australia and the UK before I went. Okay, I'm going to as the US opens up, I'm just going to let that have six months without me participating, and then I'll come in because the first wave of shows in in almost every market that's opened up have done very badly. And then, and then the second wave comes through and, and do uh, can actually be quite robust. But there's all these problems too, just about about you know different rules. I mean, and obviously Martin, you know, Martin's shows are doing very well in New York, so it's not like it's not like everything does horribly. It's just that I've, I've learned enough times now that I'll, I'll let other people be guinea pigs with, with the ever changing rules around COVID and, and around what audiences have to do and don't have to do to be in the theater. Like I've done it in two other countries. I, I don't need to do it in the USA. I think Bob, the worry, the worrisome thing for all of us now, I've been talking to a lot of colleagues about this, is I, I went to a Broadway show last night, right? Uh, and walking from my office to the theater on 44th Street, it was like heaving with people because the tourists have come back, the overseas tourists. Right at the time when COVID is starting to explode again in Europe, where these people are coming from, plus American tourists, many of whom come from states that don't bother with vaccination. Uh, and I think we're worried that New York is inviting a rebound of COVID at just the wrong time, which may start closing shows. We don't know, hopefully that will not happen, but it's a little worrisome seeing these people jammed in Times Square, uh, mostly from overseas. Oh boy. Um, so we're, we're not, we're not, a, I mean, I, I, I also believe that we're not out of the woods yet. I, I know that, that, that we, there's, there's a lot more information that has to come in before we know that we can move forward um, without worry. 
I think we can move forward with worry right now, but not without worry. Well, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because I mean, we're coming into winter here, which is which you know every, every scientist has said that's a problematic phase. And and if you look at Australia, um, well, my state in Australia, we, we, it's vaccination. I, I think I've probably spoken to most of the people on here before. Its vaccination rates were horrible in June of this year. When I went back, they were it was ten percent vaccination rates. New South Wales, where I'm from, has just hit ninety two percent people vaccination above the age of 16 so that lessens the problem like you, the, the, you know and the irony is at the moment international people cannot fly into australia still but australia is pretty well set up now to deal with that because if cases are coming in 92 percent of the population is now vaccinated and so the dip the, the problem here is it stalled it I don't, I don't know where it reached is it 70 percent wherever that stalled at you mean here in, like, here in america yeah, or in New York specific. Yeah, it, it, well, it, it just it just leaves a lot of New York is a little people. higher than the, than the than the national average. Uh, yeah, New York City is the most vaccinated place in America. Yeah. Um, so, and and if you look at London at the moment, which is I think very similar to New York in its vaccination numbers, uh, it's 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 being quite reckless <laughs> in a lot of ways. Like it's 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 just um, the the good thing if you're inside the bubble there is everyone's just gone back to life as normal and they are just ignoring the fact that there was COVID largely at uh, the downside, I guess, is it, it, whether the spike in cases starts causing problems and shutdowns again, because I mean, there's no masks, there's no masks almost anywhere in New York, uh, in, sorry, in London. Chicken um, and bis chicken and biscuits has, has been crippled by having to shut down for 10 days because of co uh, cast members getting COVID. And it's, although, it's although basically not to be unkind, but that's not why they're closing. They were playing to 20%. They were. They were going to close anyway. Okay. This this just nailed it maybe two or three weeks sooner. Because they were in a really they were in a very tough place, unfortunately. Because a lot of good people were involved in that project. Yes. Um, I know the only other one that I know of is was Aladdin had had a, a shutdown because of, of yeah. COVID. I think that was also 10 days, but that's Disney. They can afford that. I mean, I should say that blithely that. because if they're at Disney, you're probably saying, oh, no, we can't. But relatively speaking, they can. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, now that you're now that you're coming back with all these projects, um, has your plan for the project changed at all from what you thought it was going to be before COVID? Uh, are you uh, and, and another a broader question for both of you is how do you determine the best place to bring your, your show? How do you determine where the market is for the show that you're producing? Why, why San Francisco? Why New York? Why, why Australia? Why London? What, what makes you, how do you, how do you make that decision? For me, that changes. Um, so I, I've had to assess every show that I'm driving, that I'm leading. I've had to make assessments on all of those. And like I said, I've got one show in particular that was aiming to come into New York that, that, not anymore. Uh, I, I, well, well, it could. I mean, we've got we've got a theater available to us, but the 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 subject material that show is very serious. It's about someone being in a confined space for the whole two. You go, and I just go that that doesn't feel like anybody wants to watch that coming out of COVID for the next two years. It's a great show, but I just kind of go that part of my job as a producer is to figure out what's the right time to tell what story and in what town and in what city. Um, so yeah, I've had to, I've, there's some shows that I've had to go, okay, that one's pushing back a bit. And my, my lighter, frothier shows, I go, well, they probably will push out more quickly at the moment, I would think, if they're commercial shows. Um, everything for me, if, if I'm developing shows, so, so if choosing where it goes is a tricky one, uh, and it sort of depends on where, where it's in, the, the phase it's in. Like if it's development now, I go, well, that probably won't be in New York, that will be elsewhere. If it's a premiere of something, some shows absolutely still need to be branded as a New York show if you want licensing around the world. So a couple of times I just have to suck it up and, and hate the fact that the budgets are so much higher than I want because you go, the pathway for this show is it's going to have a long life for subsidiary licensing, but only if I do it in New York and it's viewed as, as a success in New York because otherwise the world won't even know that it exists if I did it in uh, Sydney, possibly even London. I think, I think a lot of great shows in London get overlooked by the rest but certainly by new york new york becomes a loss leader for so many shows um but this the smart producer basically uses new york exactly the way you're talking about it which is basically a, as a way of selling it to other markets later on um which which in many cases does work and i, I think it, it it often works 
Um, Martin, what's what's your your answer to the question of how you decide wh which market is right for which piece, and what and what you chose chose to open and what you're still holding back on? Is it all I mean, froth is it frothy and frothier and lighter, or like like Neil is saying, or is that is that a you know the, the, there's nothing coming up soon that's really dark and serious that we're working on, uh, but you know a lot of stuff lands in New York because that's where theater lives and we know there's an audience here. And you know, if we control really carefully, like we have, we have three shows in a row going into the McKittrick Hotel, Woman in Black, and we have two shows falling. We have a great relationship, and they have a different audience than theater has. They have their own half million people, so that's just a really wonderful place to be. We don't have to worry about uh, an audience there. I mean, they just come. It's, it's kind of extraordinary. Well, you just uh, mentioned one of the key words, relationship. Um, I was going to ask you about how, how you wound up at the Amundsen. I'm going, to, I'm going to guess that for both of you, a lot of the places where you're booking are places where you, were, you had relationships and you knew that you could approach them with, your, with whatever you wanted to bring in. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know Tim, my business partner, has had three or four shows at the Amundsen. That's where the last ship opened last year. And the Amundsen doesn't really produce much anymore. You know, it's part of Santa Theater Group, the Mark Taper Forum, and uh, but it's basically become, they run it as a touring, a subscription touring house. So everything coming in is either a Broadway or West End show on tour. Uh, and they, they really wanted Jamie. They thought, it, they thought it would work well for the market. And uh, the, the lead producers in London, there's Nika Burns and Lawrence Miller, uh, had relationships there also. So it just seemed like the perfect match and a good place to try out the show in America. Uh, I, I, think that, I think that's also something that would be of great interest to, to people, uh, Martin. How did you come to get, uh, everybody's talking about Jamie. How, how was it you, how were you the person that was, was bringing this to, to America? Uh, because my new business partner had a relationship. Uh, <laughs> All comes with, back to him, with, doesn't it? With, with shows that Lawrence Miller had been producing and involved with and Nika. Uh, because that's part of that touring part of the business, but it might lead to us general managing the show on Broadway, which is a fringe benefit of that relationship. I mean, you know, we, we went over and saw Matthew Bourne's new piece and spent some time with Matthew looking at touring that, uh, you know, I mean, all the touring things are coming through Tim's side and a lot of the general management and New York stuff is coming out of my side of the world. Serafina, actually came out of a show called Gumboots that I, I co-produced 1999-2000. South African show, opened at Edinburgh, went to the West End, we toured the UK, we toured the US, and then really successfully toured Europe for five years. And one of the producers of that show called up and said, you know, we're doing a 35th anniversary of uh, production of Serafina. We want you to be our partners. We want to give you touring rights for the world. Do you want to do it? That was a 10 minute phone call. We said yes, and that was that. So that's back to the the key thing, the key takeaway for everybody in the room, which is relationships. Yeah. You have to build relationships. Yeah, that's, I, I, that's... Remember, I remember Bob, when I was in my early twenties, I did a, a US, a, a, a concert tour around Australia with sort of one of the rising stars of Australian singing. And a, a producer called Paul Dainty was the lead producer on that tour. And so I got some nights to pick his brains. And one of my burning questions for him was that in uh, about five years prior, Australia had gone through a run of really average shows that weren't selling well. And then Paul brought Mamma Mia to Australia and it went crazy. And then we suddenly had the, we, then we got a flow of really good shows back in like Billy Elliot and Avenue Q and, and, and Mary Poppins, all these things started flowing in. And I said to Paul, how did you pick Mamma Mia, when, which was so unlike the other shows around? And his answer to me was, well, I got this phone call from Benny and Bjorn and then I went, oh, well, that's that's <laughs> massively handy, isn't it? But it was a good lesson to me to go, he had toured ABBA into Australia when, in, the, in the 70s and, you know, 30 years later, that led to Mamma Mia. And you go, it is that interesting thing of going, that's, I mean, it, it is a, an industry of relationships. And even though that a bit of advice from him was not useful in any direct way, it was that just that thing of going, it is all about like big, big good to everybody enjoy the people you work with don't be don't burn bridges if you don't need to and just and just work well with people enjoy enjoy working with people and, and to add on to what neil said about you know it is it, our building is about personal business about personal relationships uh on this the, this richie valence project 
uh, a new a new managing member, lead producer, joined the team, who's a Venezuelan filmmaker. Uh, and he's used to financing film. So he's used to getting large amounts of money. And he's really great. Uh, we had a, a two hour meeting, just one on one, and we got along with the House of Fire and he and his dad really want to get involved in New York production. He said, listen, if you ever have shows you want to do and, and you have a star in mind, you know, I'm in the film business, I may know them. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, there's a play I've been trying to produce on Broadway for about five years. It's a two-hander. Uh, and uh, there's one star we've been pursuing, who I can't mention, but he's a big movie star. And uh, we keep getting kind of pushed away by the agent. And I told him the guy's name, and he laughed. And he said, his agent is one of my oldest friends. Send me to info, I'll call him tomorrow. And he called the agent. The agent called the actor, and the actor said, yeah, I'd be interested in doing Broadway. Send me more information. We'll see what it is. Out of the blue, you know, a no, 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 or a stonewall became, yeah, this is interesting. Let's look at it. It may never happen, but that's how things happen. They, they come out of conversations where somebody knows who you need to know. Yeah, and or, I wouldn't. I, I don't think it's it's unreasonable to say that that people in this room are going to wind up being people are going to help each other uh, in, in next month, next year, or in, in five years. Uh, this is the time this is the place where you can actually form relationships that may pay off much much later uh, and some people actually are actually pretty uh well well along in their careers in this room as well so that's why we do that's why we do uh networking and and that's why we have the concept of community going on here at true um so so guys i still am curious about Do you, do you have, can you, can you talk a little bit more about how you can determine other than relationships, how do you know that, that your audience is going to be uh, at, at the Amundsen? I mean, you, you gave a little bit about that, Martin, but about all, all these other projects. It, what, what struck me about both of you is that you're not only doing a ton of projects, you're doing them all over the place. I mean, the, you are definitely not New York centric or even UK centric or Australia centric. You're all over the place. Um, Martin, you talked about that all, st all stemming back to uh, your new partner, Tim. Um, how about you, Neil? What, what made you, what spurred you to suddenly realize that you could produce everywhere, <laughs> anywhere? Uh, well, look, I'm still in the mode of that because, I mean, I, I had a few shows. I had a show called Holding the Man that went to London in 2010. And then I, at around the same time, I was a co-producer on um, Alan Cummings' version of Macbeth that went on to Broadway. So they were my first steps outside of Australia, except for bringing a show to Nymph, which happened in 2009. Um, I, I think it's just breaking down that wall that once you do it once and you meet, it, it really is, you do it once, you say yes to something, you do it as well as you can. And as part of that process, you suddenly meet another 10 people that live in different places and you keep in contact with them and they have projects happening. And so it is about that, that network just widens and suddenly your, your, I, my, my view from Australia, my, my view widened and the, and the opportunities that were coming to me were being brought to me from a lot of places, not just from Australians. And, and that's really, and then again, this industry comes down to the same old thing. You either say yes to something or you say no to something. And if you say yes, you start madly, you know, paddling madly to keep up with it. And then that happens and that opens other doors. Well, you say no and focus on other things. So it, it's, it's, it's a huge sliding doors thing that for me that I go, well, that saying yes to that and that conversation led to this. But you don't, you can't do it cynically moving forwards. You don't, you, you can't sort of be so cynical that you go to networking events and just get in people's faces because you because it actually happens in a much more ephemeral way than people think it, it really just is you just do you just do things and you work and you have dinner with people and you talk and you have joys and you have depressing losses and you and you sort of that's that's the that that network is not just by turning up and having a drink with people at networking events okay so R ralph lewis brings up a very sensitive and interesting point um do you find that in your networking and in your meeting other people and creating relationships, are you reaching to other other communities? Uh, in other words, are your networks diverse? And if they're not diverse, do you do you think about actually finding ways to 
to make your networks more diverse? I, mean, I, I think there's going to be more opportunities to do that. I mean, to be honest, most of the networking, you know, that we do uh, usually is Friday nights at Sardi's with a lot of producers. It's uh, uh, CTI cocktail parties with a lot of industry people. It's going to other people's opening nights on Broadway and going to the parties and seeing all the great and the good that you know, and a lot of investors, a lot of co-producers. Uh, you know, it's seeing the people who are doing the stuff. Uh, I think now there's going to be a, a much stronger push to get diversity into those groups, to get people. And, you know, I know from the shows, you know, Ron Simons, who I think you know, and Brian Moreland, and some other people who are producing now, although financially that's not great. Ron, si Ron Simons always tells the story about being the only black face in the, at the table. Um, and it, it, was, it, was a, it was a conscious choice. He wanted to do that. He was he was breaking he was trying to break down barriers like ten years ago. And, and now there's more than I mean on the Brittany Valence show as an example, uh, with with the lead producer I'm an executive producer, uh, they've been breaking our backs. Our entire team except the producers are Latin, uh, Chicano, uh, Puerto Rican, South American, except the producers and trying to get someone on the team but with the money and power to make that a worthwhile thing. And it's very hard because those people, you know, we're talking to people in the music industry. That's how we found Fernando, this, this, this Venezuelan filmmaker who also is into theater, uh, but it's gonna be a process. It's not gonna happen overnight, but I think everybody is conscious now that we need to look outside the box and it'd be great to have some new people doing this. Yeah, we are, we are definitely and, and conscious of it. One of the great things during COVID for me where I spent a lot of time reaching out is, you know, people like like Adam that's on this call has come into my life and Blair Russell and Grace Osaka. And there, there's all sorts of people from many backgrounds and, and young producers that are very smart, particularly, I mean, in London, the, the, the generation of young, smart, creative producers there is, is staggering. Um, but, but it really comes down to, to I mean, there's the networking and how shows come to exist and which projects you follow, that's sort of separate but not entirely from the moment you get to a point where you're going okay who's our creative team who's our producing team who is the the casting i think that that is where it's it's much more easily rebalanced to go those choices there we can consciously make choices that are going to increase diversity make sure we're working with a a wide array of people um that's not quite the same process as how a show comes to exist. I mean, that's a, that's a much sort of less defined area of, because a lot of mine are just like, I sit there and go, I think this would be a fantastic show. And then, and then that's the seed of it. Or I meet someone that says, have you ever thought about doing this together? So I, I, I don't know. And, and yeah, obviously as you get to know more and more diverse people, then, then the chances are those conversations start earlier with people from more diverse backgrounds. But that's, I think there's almost two different, two different things there. And I think there's been a very fast correction made to who's on the creative team, who's on the producing teams, who's on the on the casting. I think it's more conscious now. I mean, I want to ask you this because uh, here, here in New York, we see you white America sort of through the through the the door open. It just slammed it open um, for for everybody to, to become aware. Uh, and we're, you know, I think most of us are being are conscious. I don't know if we're I don't know if we're taking the right steps or not, but we're all conscious of what has to happen. Um, how does that compare to what's going on in, in in the UK? Is there any kind of movement there? Any kind of awareness? Is there a Black Lives Matter in the UK? Oh yeah, it's global. Like so, the same arguments that are happening in New York are happening in Australia. They're happening in the UK. Um, the trickiness for somewhere like Australia is we. Uh, inherit a lot of shows that are hits from Broadway. So that includes Hamilton and Book of Mormon and the, and and at and at in the Heights and and so a lot of the shows written in New York are written for like at least or at least with access to a large hugely talented African American community, a large hugely talented Latino population. Like the Latino population and the African American population of 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 the USA, I think is five times larger than the population of Australia. So. So the problem we have with those kind of shows in Australia is we are a multicultural country, um, but we're multicultural in the sense that we have a, a lot of a lot of people from from Asia and Southeast Asia, a lot of people from 
um, the Middle East, a lot of people, even just from Africa, but, but we don't have the mix that happens in America and, and what your probably your two biggest talent pools are because they're your two biggest, um, you know, diverse communities in, in, the, in, this, uh, in this country. That is one of the trickinesses of Australia. Um, and England, England is absolutely going through the same arguments as well. I mean, it, it's global. Okay, I'm, I'm, I want to actually encourage uh, the room to, to, uh, to bring questions to the table now and you know, do a virtual hand raise if you can. That's your reactions button at the bottom of your, sc of your screen next to breakout rooms and between breakout rooms and more if you're on a, on a laptop or, or a, a desktop. Uh, or just raise your hand uh, or put something into the chat. Um, okay, I see a hand raise. Where is it? Gregory, Gregory Nekrasovas. Nekrasovas, but it's a good first attempt. <laughs> Thank you. My whole life I've been getting that last name wrong. But anyways, hello, Neil. Hello, Martin. It's great to meet both of you. Um, I guess I got two questions, but I'll kind of lump them in. Um, actually, I lost my second question, but I guess I'll, I'll start with one. No, I remembered it again. Um, do you think in regards to um, international theatrical productions being much cheaper to produce in New York that you expect American uh, theatrical creatives, whether it be myself, other people to just bring their shows over to London or Australia? And I guess my follow-up question is, I'm curious to know how the theater scene in terms of, of a production and a finance situation is in Canada because I am in the very, 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 very early stages of developing like a cabaret book musical that'll be performed in like local bars here where I live. Um, but the life and career of Canadian singer songwriter Stan Rogers. So, can, can I, you, Greg, can you just, what are the, what are the two questions? My apologies for rambling on. Um, I'm curious to see what the theater scene in terms of the financial aspects are in Canada. And also, do you think American artists will go more uh, uh, to the international scene, given the costs here in New York? Um, I just I want to correct correct your question. It's probably not artists, American producers. The artists are perfectly right. happy. Mm -hmm. They're they're getting they're getting all this money that that we can't afford to pay. I mean, there have always been a lot of Americans who start shows from time to time in London. I've done it. I've done five shows in the West End. Uh, but there, there are pluses and minuses. You know, the, the, the costs are much lower. The potential income is much lower. Uh, there's a lot more product coming in and out every year uh, in London. Uh, and if you don't have an English producing partner, it's very hard because you're in a different culture in a different world uh, and all the players are different, even if you know them. So uh, I don't see shows going over there. What we are seeing is anytime you see an American musical, Broadway musical on PBS, uh, they recorded the London production because it's too expensive to record them uh, in New York. Uh, That's but, true, it's pretty know, consistently. All, but but all. I think for people like Neil and, and there are some shows that, that have started uh, in London first and, and they musicals that were designed for New York and they start them there because they can look at it. I mean, the first big production of Hades town was at the national, uh, after a small one at New York theater workshop. And do, uh, do either of you have, have any information about the Canada market? I'm, I'm not sure Greg, Greg, whether they actually would know uh, the, the answer to your Canadian question. I don't think I, either of you have ever. I don't ever know much about costs in Canada. Yeah. No. no. That's right. I'm For some curious. reason, they're so close that we'd all work there. Okay, I'm going to move to Randall Huskinson. Randall. Randall? <laughs> um, here. There you can you are. hear me? Yes, Hi. now we can. Uh, my question is, uh, there are a lot of us in this room, obviously, that are not New York centric or, or wish we were, but aren't. Uh, and many of us who are not, not necessarily high level producers. And Martin, this might more be a question for you. But for those of us who can only afford to be in New York every so often, what would be your suggestion for best networking opportunities? I mean, I can't go to Sardi's every Friday night. I, I can go once every three months. Um. I mean, it's hard because there really aren't networking events. Networking happens because 
you know, you've met somebody and they say, hey, I'm getting, you know, five of us are getting together for dinner. Do you want to join us? You can meet some interesting people. It's, it's all done that way. It's hard to do it ad hoc unless you know people who are opening a show and you get invited to opening nights uh, off Broadway, on Broadway, where there are always a lot of interesting people, producers, writers, actors, general managers, uh, press agents, ad agencies, and you can just informally meet these people. Otherwise, it's hard. Same, same in London. You, you can't just meet people without some event where they will be at where you will be introduced to people by somebody who knows them. And TI, TI is a good start. I mean, the other thing in New York is you could try and time a trip to New York to, to take part in one of the CTI classes or one of the, which is, which is not where you're going to have the, the, the top level experienced Broadway producers there, but there's a lot of young and, and yeah, they're very experienced in some cases. Like it's just, it's just a, it's just an event that brings a lot of people into the same room. Cause what Martin's saying is otherwise you're left trying to, reach out to people and have a lot of lunches and a lot of dinners in the space of a few days, which is what I've just done in London. I mean, I've had eight weeks in London and had, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner every day with all sorts of fascinating producers, but it would have been much better if that had just been an opening night of a show that I, that I could have had. You could have seen them all in one hit. So uh, we have a whole bunch of questions. So I have to go, go to a few more. I, it's Stephanie, then Glenn, then Carol, and then, then Rosemary. So Stephanie, Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm planning f with my musical collaboration songs to be in Edinburgh Fringe Festival um, and in, in New York in fall next year. So any suggestions if you're coming with your solo show, what would you propose for Edinburgh? Um, any, any inspirations are welcome. I, I mean, I think I've done the Fringe so often, uh, mm -hmm. especially when I was living in London, you have to have uh, a really good press per person working with you up there who does a, has done Edinburgh forever, A, to get you the attention you need. But my feeling about Edinburgh is if, 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 if you want that to lead to something, same as doing a reading in New York, you have to have a plan before you get there. You can't go up there thinking things will happen. You know, it's the work and, and a good press agent that work with you on this is letting people that might be good for your show and the future of your, your cabaret know it's going to be there, finding people who know them, who will reach out to them. And then of course, Edinburgh networking is much easier because there's lots of clubs for artists and things where you're going to meet everybody. But really having a plan and having a hit list of people you want to reach out to two, three, four weeks before the fringe starts is the key. Because otherwise, you're just lost in that morass of, you know, 1800 shows, uh, uh, unless you get a five-star review and all of a sudden all this tension comes in. It, it is what you make of it. Uh, and it can be terrific, but it's hard and you need the right team working okay. behind you. Okay, we're gonna move to Glenn Borders. Hello, Glenn. Hello. Uh, hi, Neil, hi, Martin. Thank you for, for being here. Um, so either one of you, I'm just curious about something off the top of your head. Uh, how do you think a musical about 19-year-old Josephine Baker would do in the UK or Australia? Because I happen to have a show like that. I, I think you And by the way, let me, I'll, preface, I'll preface it for everybody by knowing this show has won five Odelco Awards. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's worth paying attention to. Australia is a very strange market in the sense that uh, there is not really a huge market for small to medium scale shows. And our big shows are going to be shows that have been huge successes, neither the West End or Broadway. So, so um, Australia mm. can be quite difficult for any show that has not been branded as Wicked or as Book of Mormon or as Phantom of the Opera. Um, so even shows in Australia like D. Evan Hansen, it's very unclear whether that will ever find a pathway into Australia. And, oh. and, and like Hades Town and Next to Normal and those sort of shows, they, they don't really have an obvious avenue other than sort of being in a hundred seat theaters. There's no real commercial model for those. Um, the UK has a lot more theaters and a lot more access to theaters and they, American stories cross over very, like I think someone mentioned before the Bob Marley musical, like, you know, th those sort of things uh, do happen in the UK, but Martin probably knows more about 
got that idea. Glenn, is it a fairly small scale show? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a cast of twelve or five musicians, so it's not huge. Like I would I would think that's a medium sized show. It's a medium, yeah. I mean, in, in England, because the costs are so much lower, there there were so many you know mid sized off West End theaters and 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 regional theaters with multiple venues that that might be interested. It's like reaching out and talking to people about where's the right place. But there's lots of places that like starting new work and don't spend a lot of money doing it that could get behind it in a way, obviously much cheaper and, and more easily than here. Uh, there's just so many, as Neil was saying, there's so many fascinating young producers in England right now and people going into the business and wanting to do this. Uh, and it's a very different model there. It's not about raising $15 million. It's about having a better idea and you find some place and you do the show. Uh, and, you know, finding the right people, uh, in networking and finding the right people could lead to something, you know. Because Josephine nice. Baker is always a, a, a sexy character to be, you know, uh, doing stuff around. Uh, I think her, her, the image of her and what she meant in the world, and especially in her European career, was amazingly significant for African-American yes. performers. Okay, um, uh, let me ask you. I want to ask you guys: do, do you do you have do you have five or ten more minutes, or, or I mean, you only committed to six thirty, so I'm I'm fine. Are you okay, Martin, or do you need to leave soon? I'm good. I'll, I'll just cook dinner when this is done. So that's fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Bob. Did you have a did you have another question you wanted to ask, there, Glenn? Um, yes, I was wondering it. Um, how how do I find people connections to the whatever theater is on the uh, off the West End. I don't have any access to that. So how could I find something like that? So look, anyway, to cut, to cut I, have, I, have a suggest, I have a suggestion, by the way, Neil. Um, Chris Bra Brady, uh, Grady is trying to network uh, UK and, and New York producers. Um, Glenn, you are you are a creative, but you are also a, a producing creative. So you're a producer. Um, yeah. You should really be part of uh, Chris Gray, uh, Grady's group um and you that's the way you're going to meet people that are in, in london some of them are actually here some of the people from chris's group are here here today here right okay. now yeah I, I i have reached out to chris once before and chris is great uh, uh the, the, and, the easiest way glenn is to look at um is, oh he's gone i was gonna say if you look at um because whatever you do you're going to need a general manager or somebody on the ground in london to produce the show for you or with you um so I mean, the easiest way with all these things is to go and have a look at who the producers of the last five years that were just on was and go and have a look at who did Emily and go and have a look at who, you know, all, all these smaller shows that are going into the West End at the moment, they are flooded with 20-something and 30-something-year-old creative producers who, like Martin said, the difference there is they're not just being asked by an older producer to go, hey, can you put $200,000 up for my show? They are developing shows they are hiring theaters they are running marketing campaigns they're controlling the payroll themselves so they are they are very much doing what we now call general management in america and which the rest of the world doesn't really call that they do everything in their own in their office and it's a really healthy thing wow okay great thank you i'm going Thanks to move to carol weiss and then i'm going to ask a question on behalf of rosemary brandwine so thank you carol, Bob. you're welcome Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I live in LA and I'm not connected in New York at all, but I am connected in LA and I have the prospect of getting my show put on in a reasonable production here. But I've always heard that there was this special stigma attached in New York to plays coming from Los Angeles. Have you been aware of that at all? I don't, well, I would say yes and no. I, I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, a long time ago, uh, and I, I, I was involved in the uh, directing shows in West Hollywood at a couple of theaters when I was a baby director. Uh -huh. uh, and, and there kind of was, you know, when back in the day when Gordon Davidson brought shows to New York, with one exception, they were not received very well. And it was partly because they came from Santa Theater Group in LA and what do they know about theater? Yeah. I think that's changed now, but I mean, unless the show's coming from London, you don't really mention in New York where the show came from. 
<laughs> yeah, there's, there's a little line in the front of the program that says this was originated at the Steppenwolf in Chicago or originated at Center Theater Group, originated at the you know at Arena Stage. But that's not a you know, you don't blow that trumpet very loud because the show has to be received in New York. You can't use out of town reviews, usually, unless they're from London for a New York run, because nobody in New York cares. But if you get a good production in LA and you get good reviews, that gives you the entree to talk to people in New York that might be interested in, in doing your show. But I, I, don't, I don't think there's a stigma anymore. Uh, it, 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 I, it, you know, any production that's well received can get you attention from someone uh, who might be interested, at least looking at it further. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Rosemary, do you want to ask your question? I see you turn your-, your um, Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, Neil. Hi, Martin. Thank you for joining us. It's been very insightful. Uh, everyone is so concerned about Broadway houses that everyone is forgetting about the under 99 seat theaters like Polaris North or elsewhere that are, are struggling to survive. And they are the feeding grounds for new material. How, what is your assessment of what's going on in the rest of the world? I know Australian audiences really do support their theater completely, but Broadway and the larger houses are dependent on tourists. We're dependent on New Yorkers, the smaller houses, and they're still a little bit leery because we don't have the proper filtration systems or other finances to you know, allay fears. What, what are your thoughts on what we might do and how we might forge strategic alliances with our colleagues overseas? Look, uh, it's, it's not really my area in New York, except that my, my girlfriend works in politics and worked in the cultural department at New York for a long time. So I, I hear a lot. Um, one thing that strikes me about New York, more so than anywhere I've seen anywhere in the world, is that those smaller companies in New York seem to be very well funded if they're in the right, you know, if they're favored by the right people anyway. Um, there is funding in New York for small theater companies to, 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 to do product and shows that, I mean, never come across my radar, but they're, they're operating 12 months a year and they're doing a show like 12 shows a year. So I would say that I, what I am aware of in New York is a lot of these smaller theater companies that receive a lot of funding to exist that would not be funded in Australia. And I don't know if they'd be funded in, in the UK. How, how that helps to get audiences back and to get profile and to survive in this time where audiences aren't there, I, I don't have any, I don't claim to have any answers on that, but that, that would be one observation that I do think New York does a good job of supporting these organizations. Yeah. I mean, I think for smaller venues, I mean, you address part of the problem, but I mean, I go to the theater a lot again now because things are open. Uh, but I won't go into a small space, uh, not just because of ben, you know, ventilation, but because you're just all too close together. Uh, and that still makes me uncomfortable and a lot of other people. And if it's a union show, the audience has to be at least six feet away from the actors. And as you know, in some small spaces, that would mean they'd be in the alley. <laughs> uh, there isn't enough space to, you know, to take up six feet of stage space in a lot of our really nice smaller venues. So I think there's a lot of, I, th I think there are a lot of serious issues, at least for another six months or so for smaller venues. And I, I don't know workarounds. I see, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Rosemary, I know that wasn't uh, as, as positive as you were hoping, but it, it, it's, at least you know that you, you know that we, we agree you have a problem. Oh so, yes. Uh, um, so uh, does anybody else have anything that they want to say before I wrap up? Um, I know a couple of people uh, put their videos on and came into the room before. Was that because he wanted to ask a question or was it just a mistake? <laughs> um, well, then I'm going to actually thank Martin Platt and Neil Gooding for be being with us today. Um, I Let's see. Amy Stoller. Oh, I wanted to sell Glenn Borders. Make sure you look in the chat, Glenn. Somebody from the, the UK is offering to help you make connections in, in London for your show. So make sure you're looking at that, okay? Thank you. I am. I'm writing it down now. Okay, Mad good. Madeline, good. right? Mad yeah, Madeline, okay. yes. Thank you, Madeline. Appreciate and, it. And, and, and uh, Glenn, yeah, Glenn, Madeline. Glenn, one more bit yeah, of advice uh, would be. 
You, you go, Madeline. Yeah, sorry, no, I'm a director, but I could put you in contact with a few people, maybe. Oh, that would be soon. fantastic. Thank you so much. And the, the other thing I said- I will contact is, you. I'm is sorry, go ahead, Neil. As I'd, I'd say, have a look at the shows that have happened at the Suffolk Playhouse, that have happened at the Charing Cross Theatre, that have happened at the Park Theatre. Look who produced those shows, because that will give you a big insight into this next wave, this generation of really great young producers okay. that are coming through. Okay, could you, I, I had to say, do this, but could you, I, I got Park Theatre, could you say the other two? Oh, I'm so sorry. yeah, the first one's the, the Suffolk Playhouse, which is S-O-U-T-H-W-A-R-K, which is nothing like what it reads like. So yeah, South, South Wark Playhouse. <laughs> um, the Charing Cross Theatre is C-H-A-R-I-N-G Cross Theatre the park theater those those venues do a lot of new works and new musicals and and are largely done by younger producers that are that are certainly on the rise yeah great thank you so much i appreciate that okay i can unmute myself i can unmute myself because it's okay Okay. so uh, katie galloway um neil how about katie Putting, well, putting it. I mean, Katie Galloway is, she's the prime example of, like, Katie Galloway is 21 years old. She has been through the, 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 the SALT over there, which is the equivalent, the UK equivalent of the Broadway League. They have a program called the Stage One, which I don't know much about other than I know what the results are, which is that there's this entire generation of, of young producers. Katie Galloway is 21 years old. <laughs> she met me. She talked me through her show and I put some money in for one of her shows. Like that, that's, that's the difference over there is I go, I see young ambitious people in New York, but they're not given opportunities because they just asked to raise money for, for other people's shows. And they're not given access to theaters and they're not given access to government funding. That's the difference in the UK. So, so yeah, Katie Galloway is like a, like she's a baby, but she's a brilliant 21 year old. <laughs> yeah, give, give, her, give her five years and have a look at where Katie Galloway is would be my advice. So, so Glenn, you can email me about Katie. Katie's, Katie's, <laughs> Katie's spoken for us here in the, in the uh, community gathering. So is uh, 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 Ra- Ramin, Ramin Sabi. Uh, yeah, I mean, Ramin, Ramin is brilliant. I mean, Ramin is, he's super intelligent, uh, brilliant. Like that, that's, I mean, that, that, but, but the difference in, the, the difference in, in London is there's, 20 Ramines and there's 20 Katie's coming up behind it. Like it, it's, it's really, it was a brilliant trip to go look at these young, ambitious, talented, smart, creative producers that aren't interested in just being told this is the way the rules work and you have to abide by the rules. And they're not interested in just being told I'm going to produce uh, Jekyll and Hyde on Broadway. And I want you to put $200,000 up. They are doing all sorts of really interesting stuff. Cool. Thank you. So I'm going to thank uh, thank you guys again, <laughs> and wind this up for my YouTube viewers. Um, so Martin and and Neil, always grateful to have you. Um, uh, Neil, you're you're relatively new to True compared to Martin, and I'm glad that we found you or you found us. I'm not sure how it happened, but but you're part of the family now. So thank oh, you. Thank you. Um, and YouTube viewers and everybody, uh, we are still doing this f- as a pay what you can because. I know people have been through a hard time for the past year and a half, and not everybody can can do more than that. But remember that in order for us to do this, we have to have we have to pay bills. There are some bills to pay, so a donation would be really really appreciated um, at true donate t r u donate dot com t r u donate dot com, and um, YouTube viewers as well. Uh, please support us if you enjoy watching these shows, these these uh, weekly community gatherings. Um, go to trudonate.com and give us a little support. Give us a little love, as they say. Um, and that's it for, for tonight. Uh, YouTube viewers, you might also want to come join us on a Friday at five o'clock and be part of, part of this, this group here. Um, so send an email to me at T-R-U-N-L-T-D. Uh, at AOL.com, T-R-U-N-L-T-D at AOL.com. And um, put Zoom in the in the header, and I'll put you on the Zoom list, and you'll be invited every week. And it's going to be happening for a long time. I don't plan on stopping this at all. <laughs>